Hello everyone, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine, and today in this new series on oncologic emergencies, I'm discussing tumor lysis syndrome, or TLS. What is tumor lysis syndrome? In extreme brief, it's the combination of electrolyte derangements and acute kidney injury occurring in patients with cancer secondary to massive cell lysis that can be triggered within the first several days of cancer treatment. That treatment is most often cytotoxic chemotherapy, but TLS can also be triggered by monoclonal antibodies, steroids, or radiation therapy. Spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome in the absence of treatment can also occur, but it is much less common. Regarding the clinical presentation, what are the typical features? Lab abnormalities are always present prior to the onset of symptoms. These abnormalities include hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia, and acute kidney injury. If unrecognized and untreated, TLS will subsequently lead to nausea, vomiting, lethargy, seizures, renal failure, and potentially fatal arrhythmias, among other potential manifestations. Let's discuss the pathogenesis. While the pathogenesis of TLS is relatively complex, a subset of the involved derangements and mechanisms are responsible for the majority of life-threatening manifestations. It all starts with massive lysis of tumor cells. When this happens, all of the intracellular contents spill out into the extracellular space. Three of these contents are particularly problematic. First is potassium, which has a much higher intracellular than extracellular concentration. The subsequent hyperkalemia can lead to arrhythmias. The nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are released and metabolized via several steps into uric acid. Uric acid is poorly soluble in water, particularly in the usually acidic environment of the renal tubules and collecting system, where urate can be deposited. Phosphates are also released, these complex with extracellular calcium, resulting in hypocalcemia and calcium phosphate deposition in the renal tubules. The uric acid and calcium phosphate act together to cause acute kidney injury, which can further contribute directly to the hyperkalemia. And the hypocalcemia places the patient at risk of seizures. While many different malignancies have been reported to cause TLS, Three types in particular are responsible for the majority of cases. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, in cases in which the white cell count exceeds 25,000, the higher the number, the greater the risk, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, particularly Burkitt lymphoma. In addition to the specific type of cancer, other risk factors include a large tumor burden, elevated white blood cell count, elevated uric acid before treatment even starts, an LDH two times above the upper limit of normal prior to treatment, chronic kidney disease, volume depletion, and there are a number of specific chemotherapeutics. When it comes to diagnosis, as long as one is monitoring the correct labs, this is not a diagnostic mystery. There are both diagnostic criteria for TLS and a system for grading its severity but I have not seen either strictly employed in clinical practice, with the exception of considering two basic TLS subtypes. Laboratory TLS, in which the patient is asymptomatic but has the classic lab abnormalities, and the clinical TLS, in which the patient is experiencing symptoms. But there is a big caveat. Spontaneous TLS can be mistaken for much more common acute kidney injury from dehydration and or ATN, if serum uric acid is not also measured. Last, I'll discuss treatment. The best treatment for TLS is prevention. For patients at moderate to high risk of developing TLS, give aggressive IV hydration when therapy is initiated or even a little beforehand. In the absence of contraindications, such as heart failure, you want to aim for about two to three liters per meter squared of body surface area per day. For the average size adult, this is around 150 to 200 milliliters per hour. In the past, it was thought that urine alkalinization was important as this increases the solubility of uric acid, but it also decreases the solubility of calcium phosphate, 
which is now recognized to be a bigger problem. You also want to treat the patients with a uric acid-lowering agent, initiated before the cancer therapy. If the patient is at moderate risk of TLS and the baseline uric acid level is normal, use allopurinol. For all other moderate to high-risk patients, use respiricase. And if there is a contraindication to these agents, you can use Febaxostat. I want to take a quick digression to discuss how these meds work because it's interesting biochemistry and it is clinically relevant. The purine-based nucleotides AMP and GMP are released from nucleic acids. After a number of enzyme-catalyzed steps, the details of which are not directly relevant to this discussion, both of these are now metabolized into xanthine. Xanthine is converted into uric acid by an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. Uric acid being excreted by the kidneys is normally the final step of purine metabolism. However, as mentioned, uric acid has relatively low solubility. At normal levels of uric acid production, the kidney can still handle its excretion, but when uric acid levels are elevated, it starts to deposit within the renal tubules, and that's when we have a problem. So we need to either slow down uric acid production, or we need to find a way to speed up its clearance. To slow down its production, we can use allopurinol, or less commonly, febuxostat, both of which inhibit xanthine oxidase. Of course, this increases levels of xanthine, which can also be nephrotoxic. To speed up clearance, we can use respiricase, which is a recombinant form of an enzyme called uricase, which is present in much of the animal kingdom, but not in primates. Respiricase converts uric acid to a compound called allantoin, which is beneficial because it has high solubility and can be more readily excreted via the kidneys without damaging them. A major benefit of respiricase is that it works much faster than the xanthine oxidase inhibitors to lower uric acid, but unfortunately is much more expensive. Returning to our list of preventive strategies, frequent lab monitoring is also critical. For patients at moderate and low risk, labs should be checked every 8 to 12 hours for the first week of treatment. This includes a basic metabolic panel, calcium, phosphate, and uric acid. For patients at high risk, labs should be checked every 6 to 8 hours, and close monitoring of urine output is indicated in all patients. Once TLS has already developed, patients are at high risk of developing complications, necessitating preemptive transfer to the ICU if they aren't there already. Continue aggressive IV fluids if the kidneys can handle them. Initiate or continue respiricase. Aggressive management of hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. However, when it comes to calcium, do not treat asymptomatic hypocalcemia. Even with mildly symptomatic hypocalcemia, you may want to hold off on treatment until concurrent hyperphosphatemia is treated in order to limit the precipitation of calcium phosphate. Renal replacement therapy may be necessary, and when initiated early when indicated, most patients experience complete recovery of renal function. That concludes this video on tumor lysis syndrome. Be sure to check out the rest of this series on oncologic emergencies.